نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised and beseeching Allah to exalt the mention in grand peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. He is alone with no partners and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention again and grant him peace. All you who have believed be mindful of Allah and fear him the way he deserves to be feared and do not die except in a state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in faith, in our khutbah last week, we had the opportunity to discuss an important subject matter and one of the fundamental principles of Islam, which is one of differentiating ourselves from the non-Muslims in the matters of religion. And we gave a few examples relevant to that. And now by the grace of Allah and in connection with the same topic, we have another occasion that is based on this principle where you will see once again the manifestation of the Prophet's intent Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Today is the 7th of Muharram insha'Allah. And we are a few days from the 10th of Muharram. And what do you know about the 10th of Muharram? It is an ancient historic event that goes all the way back to Musa alayhi salam. Musa was known as Kalimullah, the one whom Allah spoke to directly. As in, instead of the usual revelation through the Archangel Jibreel, Musa spoke to Allah directly. He heard Allah. As we have in many ayat in the Quran, the conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa. And believe it or not, there are a group of so-called Muslims, and they're still Muslims with a distorted belief, we would say, who deny, who deny the outright, explicit, straightforward ayat in the Quran. And they try to play with the grammar so that it doesn't seem like Allah spoke because to them, if Allah spoke, then Allah is like His creation and therefore you have a problem. And those individuals have failed to understand that while Allah Azza wa Jal has qualities that we are familiar with, those of Allah are nothing like ours. Allah has power, He gave us power. Allah has vision, He gave us vision. Allah has hearing, He gave us hearing. Allah has life, He gave us life, and so on and so forth. But those of Allah are not like His creation. Therefore, there is no problem. There is no problem. There is nothing like unto Him. Yet, Allah says in the continuation of the ayah, and He is the all-hearing, all-seeing. And you're also hearing and seeing, but you can't see beyond a wall. And you can't hear beyond a wall. However, Allah sees everything, everywhere simultaneously, and He hears everything, everywhere simultaneously. That's human quality, and then that of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to Allah belongs perfection, and to us belong all imperfections. Musa was a special prophet. He was from Ulul Azmi min al Rusul, as Allah called them in the Quran, those of strong determination. Not all prophets were the same. While we Muslims believe in all of them unconditionally, we do differentiate in their ranks. Therefore, there isn't any Prophet better than the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Period. <coughs> that doesn't mean that we are undermining the others or disbelieving in them as in the case with the Jews and the Christians. 
who make a distinction between the messengers of Allah. They want to make a distinction between us messengers. We will believe in some, disbelieve in the others. And they want that to be their way of life, their path. Allah says about them, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ حَقَّ Those are the disbelievers for real. Those are the pure, 100% unadulterated disbelievers. The person who comes after all these years says, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, no thank you, I'm not interested. Yeah, I will believe in Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Adam. And I have no problem, but the Prophet Muhammad, I'm not interested. And then Islam is not interested in you also. And then Jannah is definitely not interested in you neither. And you will have no place in the life to come. No place with Allah. Those who come after the advent of the Prophet ﷺ. Whoever came before that is a different discussion. So we believe in all of them. And Musa is among those special messengers. His upbringing was so unique that during the year in which he was born, Fir'aun, which was the tyrant of his time, was in the act of killing all baby boys. Imagine the calamity. Imagine if you are one of those parents. By default, automatically, if you had a baby boy, he would be slaughtered. And if you had a baby girl, it would be taken away. They would keep the girls and kill the boys. Ajib. The level of oppression that a human being can get involved in. And how big-headed some people can be. And Musa was born during that year, so the chances of survival are very slim. But if Allah Azza wa Jal wants to make something happen, then nothing can stop it. Please tell the young man to stop playing with the bottle. If Allah Azza wa Jal intends something, then Allah the arranger of affairs, the controller of the dunya, will arrange every event and every aspect in order to fit into place so that what that which he decreed will come to pass. No one can interfere, no one can stop it. And you should, I hope I don't have to tell you the whole story. This story is a Quranic story, it's in the Quran. And Allah's wisdom entails that it is not all in one surah. It is actually scattered all over the book of Allah. So if you're really interested in getting the whole story of Musa, you would have to go over the whole Quran. That would be great. In a language which you understand, that would be greater. I know our fascination with reading for reward. But what about the fascination in understanding what you're reading? Which is why the Quran was revealed to begin with. It wasn't revealed for mere recitation. It was revealed So that you may reflect on the ayat. If you don't know Arabic, whether you hear it all day and read it all night, if you don't understand, you will never be able to do You will never be able to reflect, never be able to get a reminder. You will get a reward for each letter that you recite. Alhamdulillah. But that's short-sighted. That's why the recommendation has been in Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, read the translation of the meaning so you may comprehend it. The story of Musa is in the Quran. How he was raised, how his mother had to give him away and place him in a basket in the river and how Allah promised her that he will return him to her. And the whole story, his sister's involvement until he was brought back to his mother. And he was raised in the house of Fir'aun. Fir'aun raised the one who would destroy him down the line. Took care of him. <coughs> Maybe he would benefit us or we take him as a child. His wife said. And sure enough, after so many years, and you know the story, it was meant to be that there would be a confrontation between Fir'aun and the evil people back then, and Musa and Bani Israel or those of them who believed in him and were obedient to him. And there was a great confrontation in front of the sea. 
They were pushed to the edge. In front of them is the sea. Behind them is the enemy. Where do you go? What do you do? This is where Iman comes into play. This is where Musa knew that Allah will save him. Inna ma'ya Rabbi. My Lord is with me. He will guide me. So it was revealed to him that he should split the sea with a stick. Try to do it. Try to do it. It will never happen. That's a miracle of Allah. And he split the sea according to the scholar into 12 paths. It wasn't just like a split in half. It was actually according to the tribes of Bani Israel. So each tribe would travel in their own path. And Fir'aun is behind them trying to catch up. And no matter how intelligent you can be, if you want to use your intelligence against Allah, you will fail. If Fir'aun had an ounce of intelligence that he was using beforehand, he would have just said, let's go back and deal with this on another day. But khalas, they wanted to go into the sea behind them. You know you don't have the same capabilities, you know you don't have the divine support that Musa has. And they chased after them, and after the Bani Israel had already come out from the other side, the sea was ordered to go back to its original state, and Fir'aun and his people were drowned. Interestingly enough, Fir'aun made the final attempt to believe, which was not accepted. And from that we learned a lesson for Tawbah. That if one of us lived an evil lifestyle, and right at the moment of death, he wants to change, it's too late. It is too late. Don't let the shaitan fool one of us that you will just do this sincere Tawbah a couple of minutes before your soul departs. Doesn't happen. And Fir'aun was drowned. As a result of this event, Musa alayhi salam would fast that day as means of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being saved with Bani Israel from Fir'aun. And that remained to be a tradition that was held from that time all the way until the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. so much so that the disbelievers of Quraysh in Jahiliyyah used to always fast on that day. They also used to fast on that day. And sure enough, the Jews in Medina back then used to fast on that day. So when the Prophet وسلم, migrated to Medina, he saw that the Jews were fasting that day. He said, why do you fast? He said, this is a great day in which Allah saved Musa from Fir'aun, so we fasted, thanking Allah, he said, we are more entitled, we have more of a right to Musa and his people than you do. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would fast that day, and before Ramadan became obligatory, fasting that day was obligatory. It was a must on the Muslims to fast. And why are we more entitled to Musa? Because every Muslim loves Musa السلام, by default. I have no doubt that inshallah no Muslim on earth could possibly have 0.0001% hatred towards the Prophet of Allah. You cannot, these two can't mix with belief. Having enmity towards righteous people is a sickness. And it does not coexist with Iman. And from this we learn the sickness of the people that hate Abu Bakr and they hate Umar and they hate Aisha. You cannot be a believer. How can you be a believer and hate the righteous people? Those two don't coexist in the heart. And so every believer loves Musa alayhi salam. آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله. The Prophet has believed in what was sent down to him from his Lord, and so do the believers. 
كلهم each and every one of them آمن بالله and Allah and his books and his messengers we make no distinction between his messengers we believe in all of them unanimously whereas Bani Israel are selective the Jews and the Christians are selective in who they like and who they don't like and in who they believe in and who they disbelieve in so fasting that day became an important subject matter and so it is recommended Recommended is not obligatory that we fast. I believe it will fall on a Monday, inshallah, the 10th of Muharram. And according to the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I hope from Allah that it will expiate the sins of the previous year. So, all of the sins which were committed in that previous year, and all of us have plenty of those racked up stacks above one another all of these will be forgiven by fasting on one day this is the vastness of the mercy of Allah this is something that we are all in great need of and this is an opportunity that was given to us by Allah so let's capitalize on it there are other aspects to this however which we will discuss in the second khutbah inshallah أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in his final year before he returned to his Lord said. If I were to live till the following year, I will also fast the ninth of Muharram. The scholars understood from this a number of matters. The one which is pretty much agreed upon is that the intent and the objective based on other narrations is to differentiate ourselves from the Jews who also fast on that day. And so to prove this legacy of differentiation in matters of religion so that the Muslims and the Jews are not both fasting the same day out of the year together in order to be different from them we were recommended to add a day. The reason why the scholars prefer the ninth because the Prophet wasallam said the ninth. I would fast the ninth. However, based on the principle of differentiation, if you were to fast the 11th, then it would also fulfill the objective of differentiation and distinction. So no issue. Therefore, we have three scenarios. Scenario number one, that you fast 9th, 10th, and 11th. And the reason why there's no issue in that, because fasting the month of Muharram, in and of itself, is virtuous. The Prophet ﷺ would fast abundantly in the month of Muharram. So you're adding more fast to your book. And that way you're guaranteed, even if there was some miscalculation in the moon sighting, which is not an issue, you would definitely land that day. But I, I have an issue with this particular clause because it opens the door for a lot of people to confuse themselves when Ramadan comes. You cannot use this principle. It's a very delicate principle. To be on the safe side, let me fast. So I fast one day before Ramadan just in case they did a miscalculation and the moon sighting. And of course, it's not like we don't have enemies. Oh, we have plenty of enemies. All day, they go to the newspapers and magazines. Oh, uh, the kingdom, they miscalculated again and they're paying so much money to cover up for the mistakes. Blah, 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 blah. Every year they tell you that something happened, people don't know how to see the moon, as if we're, I don't know what, and people are so gullible. Oh, oh my Ramadan, Ya Allah! Calm down, Ya Sheikh. Relax, man. Don't be so gullible. Not everything that the news mentioned is true. You know, there are evil hands that don't want peace. They don't want peace. They don't want security. They, want, they don't want no collaboration. They don't want us to be in good condition. It disturbs them that we're peaceful. How do you distort and disturb the peace? You come up with stuff. And turn the people against the rulers and the rulers against the people. Then when everybody's fighting, 
Then they can watch on the side say, Bravo Muslims! Now we can come and eat you alive. We haven't learned this lesson throughout history, we don't learn. We love it. Internal war. Look around, it's always the Muslims, they start with each other, then the enemy comes and it's an easy prey. Pick up and go. Divide and conquer, divide and conquer. When they see a place that is not divided, they go crazy. Anything that will do the job. Don't be so foolish, please. If they made a miscalculation with Ramadan, I tell you, sincerely, it's none of our business. If they're cheating, Allah will hold them accountable on Yawm al your fasting is 100% accepted. Allah did not put you in a position of authority to deal with the subject matter. Relax, man. They say it's that day, it's that day. They did something fishy, none of our business. Otherwise, Allah would not have made rulers and people that are ruled. Each one of us would have been a ruler. Try it. See what's going to happen. Overthrowing governments every other day. Oh, this new ruler, I don't like him. Out! I'm going to come in in this place. Oh, they don't like me. I'm out. Bring someone else. MashaAllah. Do you think the Islamic history and the growth of the Ummah was with this mentality? Never. It was with people that understood the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That whoever was in charge, listen and obey. He said, even if he lashed you, even if he lashed you and said, give me your money, the Prophet ﷺ said, give him your money. Allah will give you your right. But people say, oh, these are the, these are the hadith of the people that are scared. Scared of what? These are the narrations of the Messenger of Allah. If you don't like them, take a hike, choose another religion. If you don't know the hadith, don't comment. <coughs> Learn. Learn, you will be baffled by the number of narrations that command us to be in the state of subservience. As long as it is in the light of obeying Allah. Anyone on earth who tells us to disobey Allah, we don't have to obey. We all understand that. But in other matters, keep the peace. So that this ummah can grow. Otherwise, you see us spiraling down year after year. Allahu alam until when? Until people that really live this religion come around and fix things up. So the subject is to differentiate ourselves from them by fasting either the ninth, tenth, and eleventh. If you cannot fast the eleventh, fast the ninth and the tenth. If you cannot fast an additional day to differentiate, it's still acceptable because the Prophet ﷺ did so for so many years and the hadith mentions the 10th. The Prophet ﷺ did not live until that next year in order to fast the 9th and the 10th. So his, his action, his sunnah in terms of action was only fasting on the 10th of Muharram. It's a virtuous day that we should take advantage of if we are able to do so. So brothers in faith, these occasions which Allah Azza wa Jal has spread throughout the year, whether it is the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, or the 10 nights of Ramadan, or Laylatul Qadr, or the day of Arafah, or the day of Ashura, are opportunities for all of us to make a change. Let us all understand that it is not merely a transaction. Some of us, they, we look at our relationship with Allah as a transaction. You go to the supermarket, you have an item, you pay for it, you get a receipt, you leave. In Islam, the most important thing is the condition of the heart. It is the condition of the heart. It is not an act of worship where you say, I'm going to keep leading an evil lifestyle. I'm going to do what I want. I know I'll fast on this day, khalas. Then it must be, it must be that Allah will forgive my sins. No such mentality. Allah describes a believer in the Quran, they, they put forth the good deeds that they put forth, and their hearts are in a state of trembling, that they go to return to their Lord. Ibn Umar used to say, if I knew that Allah accepted two rak'at of mine, I would depend on them. 
I will depend on salvation as in. Because Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُرْتَقِينَ Very Allah accepts only the acts of the righteous people. So the mentality of the believer is one of concern. No boasting, no showing off, no telling the whole world. You go to the haram, you take pictures and videos from the time you leave until you come back on social media so that everybody can clap for you, say, MashaAllah, the big Sheikh, the Mawlana. Posing, and this is not, this is something that the Muslims back then would never do even if you paid them money for it, Ya Sheikh. They used to cover their faces and go do the acts of worship so no one can recognize them. They would be afraid to tell the people, I'm going on Hajj. I'm going for Umrah. It was strictly business. It was secretive. Only the people that need to know knew. For logistic purposes. They would hide. If someone asked them, they wouldn't explicitly say. Now it's a public announcement for every act of worship. I know the social media has twisted our brains around. It's everywhere. I understand. I'm part of it. But my advice to me and you is when it comes to our worship, keep that on the down low. That's not something you have to post. That's not something that you need people to like. It is not a lecture you're giving or a reminder that is benefiting the people. You're doing an act of worship between you and Allah. Keep it between you and Allah. Whoever sees you, sees you. Whoever doesn't see you, they don't need to know. The condition of the heart is important. Fast that day, minding your business, making sure that you're avoiding whatever haram is out there so that it will be acceptable by Allah and hope at the end of the day that Allah will accept. That is the attitude that Allah Azza wa Jal loves. That is the condition of the believer that Allah Azza wa Jal raises. As for arrogance and pride and show off, it does not get a, pers a person anywhere. Allah says in the hadith Qudsi, ana agna shurakai an shirk. I am the most self-sufficient of ever having a partner with me. Whosoever does a deed, seeking me and someone else, I will leave him and that deed. You want Allah, but you also want a little bit of something else, not acceptable to Allah. It has to be purity for the sake of Allah. So be wary of that and be mindful of that and be considerate towards yourself before you are considered toward, towards others. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik, Allahumma ya musarif al-qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik, Rabbana la tuzur qulubana ba'd ad hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wahab. Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakiha, anta khayru man zakaha, anta waliyuha wa mawlaha wa anta ala kulli shayin qadir. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا واهد بنا واجعلنا من المهتدين اللهم اجعلنا ممن يتبع سنة نبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم إنك ولي ذلك والقادر عليه ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد